Amen. Thank you for joining me. Good to be here today. Today we are looking at four biblical tips for overcoming temptation. Four biblical tips, Bible-based tips for overcoming temptation. Uh, Lord gave me this one today. I've preached on Jesus in the wilderness before. And so some of this, if you are uh, in our little church or listen to a lot of the messages, it may be a little redundant, but I really, I think most of this is new material in terms of um, uh, what I'm going to bring up, but all of it is rooted in the Bible. That's why I put four biblical tips, because this is all straight from the word. You know, we all face temptation. Um, temptation is all around us. And people may think, oh, you're if you're a Christian, temptation goes out the door. In fact, if you're a Christian, temptation starts coming all the more. Amen. Um, the devil's perfectly fine with that person that's out of church, that wants nothing to do with God. The devil's perfectly fine keeping them there that way. But if you are, uh, if you love the Lord, if you know the Lord, if you're serving the Lord, well, then temptation certainly will come your way. And dealing with temptation is something I believe in these last days is crucial for being successful in what we're called to do, for staying close to God. I mean, if you fall into some kind of grave sin, are you really going to be close to God? Uh, no, you'll be backslid at the very least. Uh, those that that could potentially be saved may fall into some kind of temptation and never give their heart uh, to the Lord, never accept him as their savior, never, never realize their need for him and accept him as savior. I think of Judas Iscariot. I mean, he was in the inner circle. He saw Jesus Christ, what he did. He saw the miracles. Um, he learned from all the wisdom, you know, that Jesus had, and yet he still gave in to temptation. And so it's not uh, above any of us uh, or below any of us, I should say. Uh, to be tempted. We all deal with it. And the Lord just put this on my heart today. And, and I, I don't know why, um, but I'm going to go with it. Amen. I'm going to go with it. So I thank you for tuning in. We're going to dive right in. And I just have a little bit of scripture here that when a preacher is going to preach on temptation, typically, I think if they're going to go in the New Testament, they're going to go with this block of scripture here from Matthew. And it's a fascinating scripture. Matthew 4, uh, and and, and what, what I'll do is I'll just read this. But as I read this, I want you to remember two things. One, Jesus had just been baptized in Matthew 3 by John the Baptist. God had just descended from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. And now we turn the page right after he's baptized. I mean, you figure everything would be good, right? They'd go have a good meal and everything would be happy. No. You see here in verse 1, it says, then was Jesus led by up of the Spirit, capital S Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So you're, you know, and again, I don't know how much time elapsed, but it's the very next chapter. It's the latter part of Matthew 3. Jesus is baptized he, uh, by John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist said, I'm not even worthy to unloose your shoe. I, well, why would you do this? And Jesus said, just go ahead and do it because I'm doing the will of the Father and it is to be done. And so it was done. He's baptized. God uh, comes down and says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Amen. And then he goes off to the wilderness, led by the Spirit, and he's going to be tempted of the devil. Verse 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. Okay, clearly, I always say Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. I, can, I can't fast uh, 40 minutes without getting hungry. Amen. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And look here how the devil's referred to as the tempter. Don't get it confused. When temptation comes your way, it's not God, amen, it's the devil. And the devil is the tempter. But he answered and said, it is written. So here we have Jesus fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Again, you've probably heard this, but maybe you haven't. He's got to be hungry. He's in the human form, right? The tempter comes, and what is he going to hit him with first? He's going to say, if you're the son of God, make these stones bread. I mean, let's let's eat, right? I mean, you got to be hungry. But Jesus, but he, so but Jesus, answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So Jesus' rebuttal to the devil is simply, it is written. He's going right to the scriptures. If you ever wonder how important 
the Bible is, the scriptures are in living this life, in fighting this spiritual battle that we fight, amen, they are paramount. I believe it was last Sunday, the message that I preached uh, was on uh, the sword of the spirit and the idea that the scriptures is our best weapon, amen, in the spiritual battle. Uh, verse five, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And so here the devil is clearly saying, you know, God's going to take care of you, so why don't you just show out right now? You know, I mean, God's not going to let anything happen to you, so just go ahead, just you know, watch, let's, let's create a big production here. Let's create a big, um, you know, uh, a scene for everybody to see just who you are. And Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. Going right back to scriptures. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now that is a awful bargain because Jesus has all power in all universe. He doesn't need these kingdoms the devil had power over. And um, there's a Bible teacher I like to watch named Les Feldick. And he always says, were they the devils to give, to offer Jesus? And they are because ever since man sinned, the devil then had possession of of all of these kingdoms. He's referred to as the little G God of this world. And so these are his kingdoms. Amen. He had possession of them. He could offer them to Jesus. And here we see Jesus respond in like manner. Then saith Jesus unto him, get the, the hence Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leave, leaveth him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Before we go any further, when you quote scripture and when you spend time in scripture and when you meet the devil with scripture, amen, the devil will eventually flee. And what's going to happen? God and the spirit of God and the peace of God will come upon you. And that is for those that are saved. We know once you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. So for the saved individual, once you go ahead and just turn to the scriptures, turn to the word and fight fire with fire, spiritual with spiritual, you will have that peace that surpasses all understanding. And I believe Jesus had it. I believe the angels came and ministered unto him and he was able to eat at that point. He was able to be cared for. Amen. And I believe they rejoiced and they praised God because not only had Jesus resisted three temptations from the devil, but Jesus had created an eternal playbook, a playbook for all time, for all humanity to follow on how to fight the devil. So Satan was both defeated there in the wilderness and also given this plan for anybody that would tune in, for anybody that would watch, anyone that would listen, amen, anyone that would read the scriptures could then follow the same exact plan. That is it. Um, a uh, uh, dear, dear friend of mine had a, a problem last week, I think it was, and they were sad about the problem. And I said, you got to get in the book, just get in the book, whatever the devil or who, whatever the flesh, whatever was coming up in their mind that was hurting them. God's word is what will repel that from them. Amen. And so here briefly for next little bit, I'm just going to give you four specific biblical tips for overcoming temptation. Three definitely biblical tips, and, the, and they've got one in here that is kind of like a tip, but it's also kind of a just a note here. But the first one, expect expectation. Uh, excuse me, expectation. Uh, expect temptation. Expect temptation. Why? Look in verse one. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. It wasn't like Jesus had done something wrong. We know that he's perfect and sinless and without flaw, and he lived a perfect life 33 and a half years here on earth. Amen. He never sinned. That's how he was able to be our propitiation, our payment for our sin on the cross, is that him being perfect and not knowing sin. So it wasn't like he had done anything wrong to face temptation. It wasn't like his ministry was not going well. He was just baptized by John the Baptist. I mean, God himself appears and everything is going good. But yet Jesus was led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. 
We need to understand that when we love the Lord, when we're serving God, we have to expect temptation. We have to have that expectation. We have to understand that it will happen and it'll happen often. And typically the test would be what is going to take us away from God or God's plan for us and get us into something that's sinful. And I've got scripture on that in a bit. But number one here is just to expect it. You know, verse one shows us that Jesus is led by the spirit to be tempted. What does it mean to live a life in expectation of temptation? I think that is what people want to do that secretly have a desire to sin. You know, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. I lived, gosh, 30 some years, about 30 years, very sinfully. And I will be the first person to admit that there is pleasure for a season in that temptation. And it can be very difficult to part from that temptation. You know, you find somebody that, you know, the Bible says to be of a sober mind, find somebody that is full-blown alcoholic and ask them what it's like to see a beer commercial when they're trying to get away from the alcohol. It can be very tempting, amen, or fill in the blank, a compulsive gambler, whatever else. You can think of all the other vices out there. So what does it mean to live a life of expectation? It means to be prepared. It means to armor up. It means to be in God's word. It means to be prayed up. It means to expect it. Because if we're not expecting it, that's why the Bible tells us to be sober and vigilant, because the devil's like a roaring lion, right? You know, if you're expecting a roaring roaring lion to come at you or your cubs, so to speak, you're going to be prepared. You're going to expect it. You know, my wife says that when we go out, oftentimes, she feels like I'm just kind of looking over her, like looking looking to see, make sure that she's protected, that nothing's going to happen. In this day and age, you have to be the, be that way. I grew up in New York near the city, so I think that's just in my blood. But, you know, expect, you know, uh, an issue to occur because it'll occur. Expect temptation to occur because it'll occur. And I think that's a huge part um, of overcoming temptation is to expect it. Do I believe that Jesus knew he was going to be tempted as he went in the wilderness? Yes. I believe he expected it. I believe he already knew his answers. Amen. And I believe that is one key that we can follow is expecting to be tempted. And guess what? When we serve God, expect temptation to come all the more. It's not like when we serve God, oh, the tempter goes away. No, the tempter tempter doubles down. The tempter knew who Jesus was, amen. He knows who we are, amen. Expect to be tempted. And by the way, you may say, well, how do we know that God's not tempting us? Well, we know that God will not tempt, but he will allow the devil to tempt just as Jesus had been tempted. So we saw that Jesus was tempted. We know that God allowed that because we know God is sovereign, right? And you say, well, how do you know that God is sovereign over the devil? We'll just look in the book of Job. Uh, Job, the devil had to ask permission what he could do to Job, and God had to specify what he was allowed to do. God is has full sovereignty. And so we see here in James 1, 13 through 17, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Okay, so James 1, verse 13 says, neither he any man. That clearly says God won't tempt anyone. But every man is tempted, now watch this, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Wow, that's that idea again of being expecting it and being prepared because our temptation comes in things that we may desire. We're enticed, we're tempted by what we're enticed by. Now here it goes, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Amen. That could be literal death, but certainly it also means spiritual death. That's why I said, hey, be careful. Here James says in verse 16, do not err, my beloved brethren. And then I wanted to include verse 17, because it's very important. It shows the character of God. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I love verse 17, because it just kind of like, punctuates the rest of it. It says, you know what? God's not going to tempt you. He's not going to be the one that is going to be throwing these temptations your way. He's not being the one that's hoping you're going to fall into sin. He is the one that gives every good and perfect gift. I tell our kids, hey, you got a toy, you love it. That came from God. Well, dad or mom bought it. No, God gave us the ability, the money, whatever it is to get it for you. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And I love this. There's no variableness. There's no changing of God. The same God that has that love for 
the Israelites in the Old Testament is the same God that has that love for us here today. Amen. It's the same uh, individual, the same God. Amen. And then loop it up with Jesus. It's the same God that went through the temptation and overcame temptation by quoting scripture over and over again. So we see here that God is good. He is not going to tempt, but he will allow you to be tempted. And you say, well, how could a loving God allow me to be tempted? Well, think about this. We're in the flesh. We have a sin nature. Maybe we need that kind of alert or expectation of being a potential to be tempted to stay in line with how he wants us to live because he knows that we are prone to wander, that we are prone to fall into sin. We're called sheep. And if you look at what sheep do, sometimes they just wander off and sometimes they can be stubborn. They don't want to go back to where they're supposed to go. Amen. And that is how we are. And so I believe God allows us to be tempted in the sense to say, look, there is danger abounding. So get your mind right. Be be, be prepared. Amen. Understand that, that it's dangerous out here. Secondly, we aren't to fight in our strength. We're to fight in his strength. Responding to temptation, Jesus quotes scripture, and you can see in verse 4, 7, and 10, and I'll just show you like uh, verse 4 here, but he answered and said, it is written, right? And so he goes through the scripture, man shall not live by bread alone, amen, uh, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So he quotes scripture over and over again. So Jesus isn't saying, I feel this way, I won't be tempted. I have this wisdom, I won't be tempted. I have some kind of power, I won't be tempted. Jesus is saying, this is God, this is God, this is God. When we deal with temptation, when we expect temptation, when we encounter temptation, we are to fight it in the strength of God. We are to give it to God in prayer. And I, I believe this literally. You know, you encounter some kind of temptation, immediately say, God, help me. Jesus, help me. Lord, help me, right? And I think we should err on the side of praying that prayer too much rather than not enough, amen. Again, there, there are people that I think blatantly just fall into temptation. They, they're they rebellious. They want to sin. And then there are people that are kind of like, kind of playing around with the idea, flirting with temptation. Like, oh no, no, I won't. Oh yes, I will, right? We need to be vigilant and we need to fight in God's strength. When we are weak, we are made strong. Jesus gives us his example. You know, he was in human form. He was fasting 40 days and nights before the temptation came. So he must have been exhausted by the time the devil showed up. And by the way, that's not a coincidence either. Again, the roaring lion is looking for the one that it, in the pack that is the most vulnerable. And so often when we are weak, that's when the devil's going to show up. Uh, when we're really tired, when we're really burdened down, when we're overwhelmed, we see it in our house all the time. You know, we've got three kids in the house and all three, I'll be honest, can be a handful, especially the younger two. And when things are going on with them, sometimes something will be going on with them and boom, something else shows up and we'll be tired from that day or the day before or whatever it is. Amen. Is that a coincidence? No. Oftentimes it's coming when we're tired. And Jesus, he fought in God's strength and not his own, even though he is God uh, in the flesh, he kept quoting scripture. He kept saying, this is, this is, this is God and God has it and God is it and God's power. We are worse. I'm, I'm obedient to God. And that's all we have to do. And Paul gives us this light in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 5 through 10, very familiar passage of scripture. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Paul's saying he's going to glory in his infirmities. That's like me saying I'm going to glory in my allergies or in my asthma or whatever. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he uh, seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, what are the revelations? What's the abundance of revelations? Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He, uh, all these books that he wrote, these epistles, these letters that he wrote that are that's in our Bible, that is what we use uh, for our doctrine, right? And Paul was revealing a lot of these things, a lot of uh, what he was revealing was foreign or hard to understand by the uh, other apostles. And Peter and so forth was saying, literally, there's a, a bit of scripture that Peter says, it's hard to understand some of what he's saying, but it's true. And so they didn't have that uh, revelation. They didn't have 
what Paul had. Remember, Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus uh, and, and, and really had a relationship with Paul from there on. And Paul spent three years in the wilderness getting this special revelation to turn to the Gentiles. Because up to the point of Paul, uh, it was all about the Israelites, God's chosen people. And Jesus was coming to be their king. Amen. And so the idea that Jesus died on the cross for all mankind was revolutionary. And that revelation came from Paul. And hey, you know, Paul's going to be lifted up and all these things worshiped, or he's going to worship himself. I mean, again, we're human. We're in the flesh. How does God keep him grounded? He was given a thorn in the flesh. What the thorn in the flesh is, we're not told. Some people think it was an eye ailment. Uh, some people may think other things. We just know it was bad. Amen. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. So again, didn't come from God, but God allowed it, lest I should be exalted above measure. So that's why I think I explained that. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Paul, again, very close to God. Amen. Very a good relationship with God. I believe Paul had at that point. Amen. He no longer saw he's Paul. He's doing the Lord's will. He's suffering greatly. I believe the Lord heard his prayer and God said, nope. Here's verse nine and 10. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. He's saying, I'm going to do all this. I'm going to go with this. I'm going to let all of these uh, um, things happen to me, including this thorn in the flesh. And I'm not going to try to use my own power, but the power of Christ that rests upon me is greater. So I'll be glorying in that I have these issues so that God can get the glory through what I'm doing. The power of Christ is resting upon Paul. People that have great weaknesses. Um, there are many that have a lot of problems and weaknesses and ailments in the ministry. Uh, I can think of several that have great issues like physical ailments, and they're serving God, and they're doing great things for God. And it's almost laughable. It's like somebody has all of the abilities that would make a better person to do this for God, and God chooses this one with all the ailments because this one will bring the glory to God. With me, I have horrible allergies, asthma, all kinds of issues, man, you name it. And they've seemed to have gotten worse uh, over time. And I always, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think I hardly ever pray to God. I don't, God knows for him to remove these, these infirmities from me because I've read the scripture. I preach on the scripture. I study the scripture. I understand that, Hey, you know what? Uh, and I can give many examples, testify to the fact that over the years preaching, God's word, I've not been uh, uh, shut down when I should have been, amen. I have not uh, missed a, a beat when I should have missed many beats. And in fact, sometimes the times that I feel the worst, amen, I'm able to preach the best or teach the best or whatever because it's God through me. And that's just a simple testimony, giving glory to God that he'll use some inferior broken person like myself to 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 spread his word and to teach his word. And guess what? That's what God does. Amen. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, approaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. You're saying, I know somebody that's got all kinds of issues and I don't see God's strength in them. Well, here's the question. Are they living for God? Are they doing things for Christ's sake? The operative word here it's not so much infirmities, necessities, persecutions, distresses. It's for Christ's sake. You know, if you know, I, uh, I love business and so forth, and I've always had a business or two or whatever, entrepreneurial spirit, amen, to uh, make ends meet. Um, hey, you know, you can go through some horrible stuff in business, right? And are you, you know, you can say, oh, I'm going through all these things and I don't see God's strength. Well, is it for the ministry? Is it for God, Christ's sake? Amen. Is that business then fueling something for the Lord? Uh, or are you maybe in the ministry? Maybe you're a missionary or maybe you're a preacher, teacher, or song leader. Are you doing things in your heart, and your mind for the Lord? Or are you? is there some other agenda? Whatever it is, you know, there are people that are going through a horrible, horrible time, but they're not living for Christ's sake. They're living for themselves. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. We all face these kind of issues. But the reason why Paul could glory is he was 
He was doing it for Christ's sake. And that is important for you to think about as you face temptation and as you deal with infirmities and necessities and persecutions and distresses, ask yourself, am I doing this for Christ's sake or am I doing this for me? And when you give it all to the Lord, when you take up your cross and you say, hey, God, I'm giving it to you, that is the best feeling in the world because now you've got an advocate. Now you have uh, God the Father to count on because you can go to God in prayer and say, God, I'm doing this for you. You called me to it and I know you're going to see me through it. So no matter what I'm going through, I, I can glory in these things because your strength is shown. Because again, what is what has God called us to do? He's called us to accept his free gift of salvation and then to share the good news with others. That's why we're here, to bring him glory, to share the good news with others, to, to help the saints. That, that's it. Amen. What does it look like, you know, um, to, to, to be living for Christ's sake, to do things for Christ's sake? I'd say the ministry life, you're godly, you're set apart, you're obedient to God. It doesn't mean that you're not working. It doesn't mean that you're not doing something in the world. It just means that in your heart and your mind, you've given your life to the Lord, and then God's going to choose to use you in whatever position he sees fit. Amen. Remember, um, Paul, this is a good one I just thought of. The Lord gave it to me, I guess. You know, Paul here writing this, you know, for a time was, what was he? He was jailed in Rome, right? And he was jailed, he was chained to these soldiers, and they were say, Paul was writing that the house of Caesar was hearing the gospel, and many were getting saved. Now, think about the house of Caesar. Yes, soldiers, generals were getting saved, military. But how about, like, the rich people in the household of Caesar? Some of them were getting saved, amen? You see, so you could be, you know, you could be the butler for a professional basketball player or something. And that may be exactly where God wants you. I, I can think of some really good ministries that are aimed at very wealthy people and they are ev evangelical ministries. And I believe the Lord has touched uh, these individuals and put a calling on their life to reach those individuals. And you got another brother there in Tulsa, Oklahoma or uh, Kansas city or wherever they're going into the inner cities and they're witnessing to the lost and they're running food pantries and so forth. And all of these things are what God's called them to do, but it's a set apart life. It's a ministry life. It's obedient to God. Uh, and of course, you, there are some people in the corporate world that are helping to, uh, evangelize and win souls and witness for Christ right where they are. Amen. It's all predicated upon his word, uh, being in his word, and being in prayer daily. So no matter what your calling is, as you deal with temptation and as you fight in his strength, as we see here, it's predicated upon studying his word and being in prayer daily. I mean, Jesus quotes the scripture back to the devil, which begs the question, if you're being tempted and you are to fight with his word and his strength, and you're never in the word, how can you quote the word back? I'm not great at memorizing scripture, but one thing that I'll do uh, is I will take a, like a little simple verse, you know, like one verse, they'll come up on my phone or something and I'll repeat it over and over in my head, even at night, even when I'm sleeping or coming in and out of sleep and, and whatever kind of issues that I'm having, whether it be some kind of stress or a bad dream or whatever it is, uh, I'm kind of combating that with just repeating the scripture over and over again. And I know that sounds very simple, but that's actually, I think, a really solid strategy. Uh, other things that I do is obviously have the morning time with the Lord and the Bible. Amen. I know some people, they, they don't have a lot of time in the morning. Maybe they have to get up a little bit earlier, uh, try to get into the word at night. I've been listening to a lot of audio books from these older saints of God. Amen. Uh, that are that are free. And I'll listen to those. I'll listen while I'm awake. And sometimes I'll play them even uh, while I'm sleeping. Amen. And all all I'm just saturating myself in scripture why? Because this advice I'm given uh, it, by Paul and 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 um, by Jesus, amen, is to fight with the word, fight temptation with the word and fight in his strength. And I need to have a, a real good handle on the scriptures to do that. Amen. And so there's no excuse not to be in his word. And the other part of that is praying. We don't just want to be in his word. There's some people that, that spend their whole lives writing about the Bible or commentating on the Bible that may not even be saved, that never pray. You have to, you have to be in the word and then pray to God, seek his will. Amen. Pray over the scriptures. Thirdly here, subtle and unique temptations tailored to you. Okay. Is this a tip? I don't know. Subtle and unique temptations 
tailored to you. I don't know if this is a tip, but this is what I believe you you will face. You know, Jesus was tempted with food, fame, and power. If you look at verses 3, 5, and 8, food, he must have been very hungry. 40 days and 40 nights fasting, the devil tempts him with food. You say, yes, so what? Well, think about it. That was not a temptation that was just random spaghetti on the wall. Let's see what sticks. That was something very particular to the circumstance Jesus was in. Fame. He knew Jesus had this God-type person to him. So I don't know exactly what the devil knew, but I think the devil knew he's God or his relationship with God. So he's tempted to prove it to those unbelievers, which again is a perversion because Jesus is doing all the healing already and the unbelievers need to either believe or not, but it's not of the devil to try to orchestrate that, right? But that's what the devil wanted to do. That was the idea of being on the pinnacle of the temple and saying, hey, get the angels to cast you down. And power. So this is a cheap imitation of what was to come, but he was still tempting Jesus to have power. And I thought about this. The devil, in a way, was telling Jesus, oh, forget the pain that you're going to have to face at Calvary. Why not just enjoy this power now? You know, you see how the devil just is so subtle and he tailors these temptations really unique to Jesus. Do you think that same devil is not going to come at you in the most subtle way to tailor those temptations exactly to what may get you to sin? You know, I want you to think today, what are your weaknesses? The devil doesn't want you to do this. What are your vulnerabilities unique to you? The devil doesn't want you to think like this. If you start thinking about, well, what could get me? What could kind of get me off a track? right? Because when you want to look at the temptation, the devil's not going to tempt you to go and eat broccoli and be healthy, okay? That's not going to get you off track. The devil's going to tempt you to do something that's going to appeal to the flesh. What's the devil's goal? It's to make you to become your own God and leave the true God. That is sin, amen. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the devil said, oh, you surely won't die if you eat of that fruit. You'll be like God. The devil to Jesus in the wilderness, you can be like God. You can have all these things. Why do you have to go through God's route? Go through my route. So what is it that's unique to you that would appeal to the flesh? Think about that. You know, I don't know each individual well enough to try to give examples to whoever may listen to this or watch this, but I would say that you know you and you know what could get you. Amen. And I think it's different for each individual. We have different um, peculiarities. You know, I mentioned... Uh, business. And for me, I'm always mindful because I, I God gave me that entrepreneurial spirit since I was just a kid and I've always been that way. And so a lot of times there may be a business opportunity. I, I'll give you one example, a very simple example. Uh, but years ago, there's a family member that wanted to do a little business that seemed so simple and it, you, know, you have a partner in the business and it was like everything was laid out perfectly. And I decided it was a temptation because God wasn't at the center of it. And I didn't have any kind of Holy Spirit inclination to do it. And it would bring another person into the business that's not God. Amen. I don't have any partners because in my mind, and my heart, I say God's my partner. Amen. And not just my partner, but the, the, the he's the controlling partner. Amen. I'm, the, I'm just a bond servant over here. But what I do uh, is for God. Abraham, he took over and battled the Sodomites when they had, or excuse me, he battled for the Sodomites. Uh, because um, his nephew Lot had been captured and he came back with spoil and uh, the the head of Sodom said, hey, let me give that to you. And he said, no, lest you say or anyone say that we made Abraham rich, because again, he's God's servant. And so uh, that's an ex- a personal example, but let me let me just break that down. I look at how I am, right? I look at what could tempt me, right? Like some kind of business thing that, w- that would be interesting. And then I look at the Bible and what the Bible says. I look at the Abraham passage and I reckon those things, I calculate those things and I realize, okay, this could be a temptation. And so for you, again, look at who you are. You know who you are. You look at the scriptures and if you say, I don't know any scriptures, well, then that's why you got to get in the book, amen. You get get in the book and then you read the scriptures and say, oh, okay. Now they start coming up in your mind and then you reckon, is this of God or not? Okay, finally here, God's reward is always better. It's always better. What was Jesus promised? Food, fame, and power, basically. That was, those are the temptations. <laughs> it's, it's almost laughable, okay? What was, I mean, Jesus, he, he, he could turn, uh, you know, 
uh, uh, the, the fish and the bread into as much food as needed. He could turn water into wine. It's crazy that he was tempted with that, but that's what he was tempted with. What was Jesus given for being, being obedient to God, the father? Uh, I love this verse, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Well, that sums it up. So Jesus is obedient to the father. And what is given to him? All power in heaven and in earth. He has all power. He has power over everything. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And by being obedient to the Father and going to the cross at Calvary, right? Not, uh, I believe that was the temptation there giving him the kingdoms is that he wouldn't. Given all power, amen, he, he has given a life, salvation to millions of souls who will bow down and worship him for eternity in heaven. I believe there will be beautiful worship of Jesus Christ and the blood shed at Calvary in heaven forever. And he'll see this and he'll have this glory given to him that would have been impossible if he had given in to such a temptation. And that glory is so beautiful. It's the blood bought salvation of mankind. It is a gift, a free gift. It is unbelievable to think about what he's done for us. It's incredible. And that's the point is that God's reward, all power, heaven and earth, uh, the, the, the just the glory that he has from what he has done, amen, is so much greater than anything the devil could have tempted him with. God's reward is always better. Now, I've got a few here and then I'm done. So the reward here on earth, Romans 8, 28, we know, all, uh, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So we see here Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. So we know that when we are promised um, uh, uh, something from God that we read earlier, there's no variableness or shadow of turning. We know that this is as good as gold. This check will clear. Amen. It is going to happen. And that means that all these things are for our good. And so that promise is better than whatever the devil can tempt us with, because if we're not doing what God wants us to do, and we're living in the world and we're falling into sin, that is not good. Amen. We are to love God. We're called according to his purpose, and we will be blessed. Everything, even hardships. Uh, my wife and I talk about it all the time. It's good to deal with hardship because then you could appreciate the good thing. How do you know if you go to like an awful, uh, if you have an awful lunch somewhere, amen, how, uh, then you have a great lunch somewhere else. How do you know the lunch was great if you hadn't had the awful lunch I mean, you don't have any perspective. You have like the worst car ever. You know, I had a car one time. Every time it started, I had to jump it. Every time I had to pop the hood, I had to jump it. I, they didn't have those battery packs back then. I had to flag someone down with my jumper cables it, literally every time it started. So when I had a car that didn't do that, I praised God. But if I had started with a car that didn't need to jump every time you, you had it, I would have never appreciated it like I do. You get the idea. All things work together for good, even the bad things. Psalm 84, 11, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. I love that. He's light and he's protection. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So as we walk uprightly, as we live for God, he's going to give us all the good stuff. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So that means, number one, when the Lord is getting us away from something, it is not good for us. And the things that he does give us, all good things come from God. The Bible tells us that as well. We should give him praise because this is greater than any kind of temptation we could give it into. Because again, if you're giving him to temptation, you're not walking uprightly, right? So you're walking uprightly and you are blessed by God. He, no good thing will he withhold. Amen. I believe that. I've been saved, living for the Lord, uh, goodness, for over a decade and uh, which you say, well, that's not maybe that long. Well, yeah, it's a quarter of my life, I guess. Um, and he has been so good. And my worst day with the Lord is so much better, the much, much better, unspeakably better than my best day without him. And he has blessed me. And he's made uh, my dreams come true. He's given me a peace that surpasses all understanding. He's given me hope. Uh, he's given me just joy unspeakable. He's given me purpose. And I can testify forever, amen, how good God is. He won't uh, uh, withhold a good thing. Devil doesn't want you to know that, by the way. Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. So again, as we live for the Lord, as we uh, 
go away from these temptations and we sell out to God, amen, and we get on fire for God, we live for God as God calls us to live, not perfect, but repentant before him in all ways. You know, when we live righteously, guess what? He hears our prayers. I think that's very important to, to delineate. The world wants you to think that God hears everyone's prayers or no one's prayers. The Lord is far from the wicked. So if you're giving into all this temptation, you're living wicked, you're, you're laughing it up now, God's far from you, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that God hears my prayers. And uh, not a really a day or a week goes by where we won't talk in our family or at church about what God has done about something specific that we've been praying for, that I've been praying for. And uh, I can testify that God has heard my prayers. I believe that I've prayed something. God moved on it uh, many times over. And I thank God for that. That's Proverbs 15, 29. And then in heaven, just two more and we're done. First Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You know, Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So we love God. We're trying to keep his commandments. You know, uh, the idea of for Christ's sake, you love him so much. You know, you love someone, you're willing to suffer for them. I love my wife. And so I'm willing to suffer for her. Amen. I love my kids. I'm willing to suffer for them. <laughs> I, I, su I suffer them daily. Amen. But uh, I love them. I'm willing to suffer. I love God. Amen. So I'm willing to live for God. And guess what? If the Bible tells us eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard. We haven't even been able to have in our heart, the deepest part of us, any idea what God has prepared for us in heaven. I don't know what heaven's like, but I know it's better than anything we can imagine. I know it's absolutely spectacular. It's impossible to put into words, but it is. there's no sickness there. There's no sin there. There's no uh, problems there. There's no issues there. There's only wonderful, wonderful time there with God, eternity with God. And I believe we'll be very active in heaven. We'll be working for him. There'll be all these great things we enjoy on earth will be times a hundred million in heaven. It'd be hard to imagine. That's what heaven's like. Finally, John 14, three. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. We'll be with Jesus. We'll be with Jesus. God's reward is always better, and the best reward is to be with Jesus. I believe the true pain in hell isn't the fire, though it's there. Isn't the gnashing of teeth, though it'll be there. Isn't the, the pain and the regret, the absolutely wanting to pull your hair out because there was nothing you could do but just simply believe, and you didn't do that. I believe the biggest um, hurt in hell will be the distance from God because you'll finally realize your need for the living Savior. And us, those that believe, those that have trusted Jesus, will be in heaven with him, amen, for an eternity, will be with him. He's prepared the place. God of the universe, the creator of all mankind, has prepared a place in heaven for those that believe, and we will be with him. And that should be enough to fight our tails off through the strength of God, through prayer and through being in his word to stay away from temptation and to live for him and be fruitful for him until he calls us home. Thank you for tuning in. Take care. God bless and amen.